Hello friends. In this video, I shall be talking to you about a very common problem in urological practice that is pelvic ureter junction obstruction. Why this pelvic ureter junction obstruction occurs and once it occurs, how it adversely influences the kidney. The site of obstruction in a patient is the place where the pelvis changes into the ureter, the pelvic ureter junction. It is known as PUJ obstruction. Some people call it UPJ obstruction. It is same thing. The main reason of its occurrence is a kind of dyskinesia in that small portion of ureter which joins the pelvis. A segment is involved in dyskinetic process. If I am to enlarge this segment of pelvic ureter junction, it looks something like this to you. In some patients, the site of obstruction is the mucosa, the urethelium of this junction, where the urethelium is thrown into small folds and these folds enlarge over a period of time to give rise to obstruction to the renal outlet. So, patient develops hydronephrosis. But in majority of patients, the site of obstruction is not mucosa, but the muscle coat. In the muscle coat, in more number of patients, you have the excess tissue at pelvic ureter junction. And this pattern is called type 1 kind of pattern of PUG obstruction, where you have in most patients the excess muscle bundles either due to hypertrophy or due to hyperplasia. In either group of patients, instead of muscle, you have more collagen fibers there. Right? So it's kind of hypercollagenosis. And in between these increased muscle fibers and collagen fibers, the number of nerve fibers do not grow. So there remains a relative depletion of nerve fibers and consequently the conduction of peristaltic wave through this muscle segment is not smooth, not uniform. That's what I mean by dyskinesia. In some patients, you develop inflammation in the urothelium or in suburothelial plane and there occurs inflammatory cell infiltrate which will again increase the volume and will worsen the obstruction. So, in type 1 pattern of UG obstruction, you get excess tissue at belly urethral junction, either muscle or collagen or the inflammatory cell infiltrate. In another variant, if you look at this is, this is the normal appearance of PUJ, what happens is that the muscle coat becomes very thin and very atrophic, like this. And so much so that if you put a ureter catheter through the lumen of PUJ, you will see the ureter catheter through the wall of pelvic ureter junction. It is very thin, atrophic and because of that, it is not able to conduct peristaltic wave and thus cause PUG obstruction. So you have these mechanisms common to everything is that causes dyskinesia in the movement of peristalsis. So the outflow of urine from the kidney is impeded resulting into accumulation of urine in the pelvis. So if I were to ask you a simple question that Though this disease is congenital, over a period of time it progresses and when it stays in the body for some time, what happens to the kidney? And this question is very relevant because patients come to us at various ages. So this means the disease has persisted in human body for that much duration. How this progression takes place? Most patients who have PUG obstruction remain with hydronephrotic kidney and they live like that for very very long duration. And this, this phase I like to call as uncomplicated phase where it is slowly slowly uh, progressing or it may be even static. 
in some unfortunate patients, sometimes a complication develops. And as that sets in, it will be called as complicated phase. The uncomplicated phase, a patient can come to you early stage, but this can stay in the body and patient can come to you at later stage. And when they come to a later stage in adulthood or beyond, there is a variable degree of loss of renal function. Some patients would develop complications and these complications can occur at any stage in the natural history of the disease. And these are three complications, either trauma or infection in the collecting system and parenchyma or the development of stones, secondary stones. When these things happen, they create an additional trauma to renal parenchyma which will accentuate the damage which had been existing previously. If I were to summarize to you what damages the kidney in a hydronephrotic kidney, the hydrostatic pressure within the pellicular system is the main reason. And in some patients, the stemia takes place in the parenchyma. So, a combo of hydrostatic pressure and semia damages the kidney. You may ask me what protects the kidney. And this is the renal pelvic shape and compliance of the pelvic wall. And there are certain backflows which take place from pelvic glycerol system outwards which reduce the hydrostatic pressure. These two, this combo protects the kidney. So, you have a kind of a state of balance wherein what increases the damage, the intercalicial pressure and then consequent ischemia and what protects the kidney, the pelvic shape and pelvic compliance and the backflows. So, a patient can have a balancing situation, some damaging factors playing role, some protecting factors playing role and patient is in a state of hydrodynamic balance. In a hydronephrotic kidney, the pressure is constantly high for most times. But if a patient takes a lot of water for a while and then this kidney starts producing more urine, suddenly it will blow up. And once it will blow up, there is a state of episode of pressure rise. This will put pressure on the papilla and will give rise to papillary atrophy. And once papillary atrophy takes place, the collecting ducts which drain through the papilla into the caliceal lumen, they start getting dilated. And into the dilated collecting duct, the flow of urine is sluggish. The flow of urine is impeded. The pressure of collecting duct is also higher. And this results into the atrophy of the tubular epithelial cells. These cells have been made by nature to concentrate the urine, to reabsorb the water. Once these cells become atrophic, they lose the concentrating ability. With the result, natriuresis takes place and the urinary output from that kidney is more. So, obstructed kidney with high intercalicial pressure will give rise to more urine production. In a situation of episodic rise of pressure, some urine escapes in the renal interstitium. And this sets in edema, which gets replaced by extracellular matrix and fibroblastic reaction and fibrotic changes. And this fibrotic bands compress the tubules from outside. So see, the tubules from within are being damaged by higher intertubular pressure and from outside the fibrotic bands. And when tubules are damaged in any kidney, the urinary production, the urinary volume increases and this will increase the intrapelicial pressure again. So now you have a vicious cycle. Increase intracalicial pressure, more compression of the papilla, more tubular damage, more output, more pressure. And thus, this kidney damage becomes a progressive phenomenon. You can have a one more situation of episodic rise in the pelliculicial pressure. Uh, normally, the renal artery divides into two branches behind the renal pelvis and the relationship is something like this. In some patients, the renal artery divides little early. The fork formation is little early. And 
the junction of pelvis and ureter tends to lie within the fork and there are situations when this junction a pelvis and upper ureter prolapses outwards to this fork and when the prolapse happens there occurs kinking in the ureter over the vessel and this kinking will lead to obstruction to the renal pelvis outlet the urine will accumulate in the renal pelvis patient will experience pain and then as more and more urine fills up in the pelvic cricial system it becomes from ovoid to a globular structure ball like structure and when the belly ball stretches because of high pressure the ureter pelvic junction which has prolapsed to the fork tends to get backwards in again it kind of a deep prolapses back to normal situation and because of pulling effect of the stretching pelvic wall and when that happens the kinking is removed the obstruction is suddenly removed and uh, whatever amount of urine has accumulated in the kidney will pass down the ureter into bladder and patient will pass lot of urine this condition is called as details crisis and it is also called as ureter vascular tangle so ureter vascular tangle occurs in very select number of people as a cause of pg obstruction this gives rise to intermittent rise of pressure and i just told you what the episodic rise of pressure will do to the kidney in majority of patients in place of the episodic rise of pressure you have a state of constantly high pressure in the kidney and this results into increased resistance to blood flow in arcuate arteries and this will lead to progressive ischemia of the renal parenchyma resulting into atrophy now let me explain this through these illustrations this is normal anatomy the on the outer surface of calyx there are arcuate arteries one comes from above one comes from below and the anastomose there when you have a calycial dilatation like this or a more calycial dilatation the ballooning of the calyx as this balloons more the arcuate artery is compressed between the renal capsule on one side and increasing intracalycial pressure on the other side so these two structures compress the arcuate arteries in between and therefore the flow of the blood through arcuate artery becomes lesser and therefore the parenchyma develops ischemia and atrophy so summarizing to you what damages the kidney progressive tubular damage progressive interstitial nephritis a progressive parenchymal ischemia these three events are going on all the time in that kidney and they are all interrelated one versus the other let's look at the second aspect what saves the kidney the pelvic shape and compliance and the back flows are the protective factors let me elaborate to you this pelvic shape and compliance issue normally this is how the kidney looks like the pelvis and the calycial system if a patient has a larger extra renal pelvis if there occurs pelvic pressure rise the extra renal pelvis will bulge out like this right it bulge out and this ability to bulge out depends upon the compliance of the wall of the renal pelvis and this bulging out phenomena of the pelvis balances the pressure rise the pressure does not go into calyx and pressure does not influence the papilla and the parenchyma some patients who have intrarenal pelvis there is nothing to take the brunt of high uh, pelvic wall pressure as the pressure increases the calyx immediately start getting dilated and they dilate more resulting into very severe degree of parenchymal damage the point i am trying to make is if you have a patient of intrarenal pelvis his kidney will be damaged faster and sooner if he gets a pg obstruction the extra renal pelvis this is how it looks normal when there is obstruction it accumulates more urine becomes more globular bigger and still bigger and you find a patient who have a very large renal lump and normal kidney sitting at one particular point as a pole as a small little cap there or this very limited calycial dilatation but the pelvis is very very big it is only in the later stage the calyces start ballooning out and then these calycial ballooning will lead to the loss of renal function so in patients of extra renal pelvis although the lump will form but parenchyma may not be damaged so badly 
let me talk about the backflows. The one backflow, which is called pyelolymphatic backflow, it operates from the renal pelvic wall or fornices or in frontibulum. And these thin lymphatics go medially into the renal sinus. So whenever there occurs rise of renal pressure, the urine accumulates in the kidney, pelvic renal system. This urine is going back through the fine lymphatics. This is pyelolymphatic backflow. The other backflow is pylosinus backflow. The fornices, thin fornices rupture and from the rupture, the urine leaks into the perifornicial space and then it goes to renal sinus and from there, this is absorbed back into the circulatory system. This is pylosinus backflow. The third backflow is into the collecting tubules and this is called pylotubular backflow. Whenever the pressure rises in the calyx, and if the papilla is flattened out and the flow of urine goes backwards into collecting duct and brunt of pressure goes in that way. So friends, these are three backflows which nature has made to reduce the pelliculicial pressure. And now I want to give you a summary of how the hydronephrosis progresses in uncomplicated stage. At one hand, you have those mechanisms and factors which damage the kidney parenchyma, the progressive tubular damage, the progressive interstitial change, progressive ischemia and those people who are habit of drinking excess liquids, they will give rise to intermittent rise of pressure over and above the constant pressure. So these are damaging factors. The protective factors on the other hand are pylosinus backflow, pyelolymphatic backflow, pilotubular backflow and the compliance and the shape of renal pelvis. So on one side damaging factors are playing role, on the other side protecting factors are protecting. And this understanding is very very crucial. Why this happens? Adult with hydronephrosis, one patient has 40% function, other patient has 10-15% function. This happens because of this understanding that if in one patient damaging factors are more operational, the kidney will damage more. In either patient, if protecting factors are more operational, they will protect the kidney. So you get a state of hydrodynamic balance in many people. Some damage and some protection and that is balanced out. That is why patients live long with that functioning kidney. In complicated stage, most patients develop the infection. This is the commonest complication in hydronephrotic kidney. Infection or a stone or a trauma. So in that order of commonness, they happen. And whenever they happen, they will damage suddenly the kidney a little more. Okay. So over and above the existing damage, a new factor will play to damage the kidney more. And these are usually acute events in these kidneys. So I hope you understood the progression of renal damage in a case of PUG obstruction. And thank you very much for your patient watching. In case you have any questions, you can put it on my email.